Okay, so next I'd like to introduce Dr. Julian Langton Lockton, um, who's going to speak to us about the role of specialist physician um, in looking after this family. Um, Dr. Langton Lockton is a UK trained specialist physician in sexual health and HIV medicine and is the clinical director of the Sexual Health and HIV Service Queensland Health. He's worked as a consultant in the UK and in Australia. His clinical expertise and interests include comprehensive HIV care to all and he is experienced in the provision of care to culturally and linguistically diverse populations and women. Teaching and education are great passions and he's actively involved with the sexual health and HIV education at local and national meetings for NGOs, GPs, allied health students and colleagues. Thank you. Thank well, thank you. It's a great honour to be here tonight and uh, uh, it's uh, thank you for uh, spending a bit of time um, to hear the fantastic speakers we've heard so far with Samira and Maria and then we've got Jackie and we've got Margaret. And what I'll try not to do is duplicate some of the stuff and all the hard work that's going into it. Um, my background really is I came into HIV uh, medicine um, very much because uh, I was absolutely fascinated by who was affected by HIV and, uh, and the impact. And it also it's a, it's a multi-system infection, but at the end of the day, it is just a virus and how you deal and treat and discuss and build someone's confidence with that virus. Uh, and also in the time I've been working in the last two decades, we've seen an absolute transformation in not only the um, technology and the medicine, but also really in reducing what is a, a word which you've heard throughout the uh, day, which is uh, stigma. And stigma is a very big part of living with HIV, irrespective of, of your background, cultures and beliefs. And, and you know, one of the things which I always say when I first meet someone is, you know, I, sometimes it takes me 15 minutes, 20 minutes, or even half an hour before I even discuss HIV. And it's really sort of discussing what is really important to that person, you know, understanding why they're here, and just asking about the family, kids, asking about aspirations, schools, you know, all these kind of things. And you actually kind of find out that, and you can assess in that time how much the impact of HIV is, because some people will talk about everything else, but and coming from the UK is actually a very interesting experience because a lot of my HIV care has been in really uh, culturally diverse uh, communities. And when I used to work in London, uh, I worked in East London, I had a very big practice. I worked in a busy uh, sexual health and HIV centre and I'm, and I'm primarily a HIV physician uh, and I've got infectious diseases uh, training as well. And um, it, in, within my centre, I was looking after, I was, as the lead consultant for HIV, I was looking after over a thousand people who were living with HIV, of which 70% of those came from Africa, of which 70% of those were women. And so it's really interesting because, you know, we had a lot of people who were getting pregnant, but a lot of cultures, and we had over 54 African countries represented just in my clinic. And one of the uh, things that was very interesting, you'd quite often have family members where there would be a husband and wife and a child who wouldn't discuss, who had never discussed about their HIV. Which was uh, which is which is really difficult, and and so you you never saw the family together, and you couldn't really sort of depend on, and they had no support because no one ever talked about HIV. We also had uh, a, in the clinic we had two middle-aged sisters who were from uh, East Africa who who were were had been coming to the clinic for about ten years. Uh, had spent most of their life in a refugee camp in Kenya and they'd been in the UK for about, I think, about 13 years. However, they used to come to the clinic separately because they'd never talked about their HIV. And so they were absolutely convinced that they, that, and they, that they, did, that, that they were the only people who knew about it. And once, uh, I remember one of the sisters got ill and, and her sister visited her in hospital. And when I came in to see her, um, she turned around and greeted me and the sister went, how do you know him? 
So, you know, very interesting. But, but working with that and, and bringing that support is absolutely vitally important. So, um, so as everyone has said today, there's so much. And when you've got someone like who's just arrived in Australia, has um, had a really tough life, has got a lot of dependent uh, children. She's got a partner who is still overseas. And then suddenly uh, there's a whole group of people um, prying into your business and wanting to know and offering care. Some people really pull back and say, you know, actually I've been doing quite well for myself up to now, you know, why is everyone getting involved? So being linked into HIV care as, as within the Australian system. So uh, the Sexual Health and HIV Centre at uh, Metro North, we're a sexual health uh, specialist. We have ID specialists there as well. And I think one of the most important things is that we have no barriers to care and there is no cost to the patients at any point of that care. And we will, and we work very well with the, uh, with, with, as Jackie said, with the Public Health Unit, work very well with non-government organisations. And we also uh, ensure that it's not just about the HIV, because if you are HIV positive and you don't have Medicare, it might be all the other things that you need to worry about, your heart disease, your hepatitis, your liver, and other health issues. Um, and it's really trying to ensure that you get that equity of care. So, okay. So we get referred from many different uh, uh, avenues and and uh, so quite a lot of people are here on uh, skilled visas and they're applying to stay as permanent residents and they get their testing and they find they're HIV positive. Um, you get other people who've come through the pathways which have been, been as described here and there's also people who have been uh, awarded visas overseas before they come. Um, we also get people who have been referred from um, the public health unit straight to general practitioners and general practitioners uh, then refer back to us and also you've got uh, non-government organizations such as QPP um, which all we're all on the same page and what we really want to do is when someone's diagnosed with HIV or, or if it's existing HIV is how do we engage them with the system uh, in Australia because it's definitely going to be different than what they're exper experienced and as Jackie was saying quite often they're on medications which are very good and work, but they aren't particularly nice to take and we wouldn't prescribe them and so, and they have lots of side effects. And, and as Margaret was saying, there's a lot of people who actually might know they're HIV positive, but um, they have a GP checkup six months or eight months or even 12 months down the line. And when, when they have the HIV test, they don't tell the GP that, this is the, that they've had a HIV test before. And quite often you've got a GP who's absolutely terrified, who calls up and says, well, I've got someone who's HIV positive. And then we just have to ensure that there's a support and pathways of which uh, people can be referred in. So we at our centre, we are a, what we call a, we're a public uh, funded clinic and we are block funded. So we, uh, within our budget, we ensure that whether you've got a Medicare card or you are Medicare ineligible, we ensure that you get the same equity of care. So it's free at the point of entry. With, if you're HIV positive, we try and ensure that uh, at least that there's a, it, it's, it's a friendly environment. And one of the ways that uh, the first thing is to allocate a nurse manager, which is really an advocate. It, it doesn't mean that you've got to come in just for your clinic appointments. You can call in for other uh, things. And even if it's just coming in to ask a few questions, they will be available on the phone. We also have two psychologists. We ensure that there's appropriate language uh, facilities and an interpreter, as, as been mentioned, is really important. We generally use a phone interpreter, but a lot of communities uh, are very worried about the person that's on the end of the phone. And quite often they ask for someone that they, that they might know or is a friend of a friend, just because they need to ha see that face and know who is speaking. And, uh, and uh, we also, um, work very closely with other specialists in other um, subspecialities uh, and we have strong links with the community. But coming to the, coming to the centre is, is really, really important. And I think, you know, 
all the things that we as a, as a, as a country and HIV care is always pushing out, you know, these absolutely wonderful ideal, uh, ideals. The WHO has pushed out the 90, 90, 90, uh, and that should be achieved by next year, which is 90% of people are diagnosed, 90% of people are on treatment, 90% of people are undetectable. And now, because there's a few countries that have reached the 90-99, they're pushing the 95-95. But that's great. There's a few countries in the world which have achieved 90-90-90, and Australia is one of them. But globally, when you look at um, the figures, so uh, it's 75, 79, and 85, and that's uh, and, and that's uh, only 75% of people have been tested and know about their diagnosis. And as been mentioned before, knowing about your diagnosis and the stigma can be huge. Uh, of those people which we diagnosed, still with less than 80% of people on treatment, and not all of those are undetectable. In Australia and in, in the world now, one of the things that is really sort of passing that message on and which gives people confidence because everyone's worried about their siblings, friends, family, and passing on the virus to other people, but also getting that message out that when you are on treatment and your virus is undetectable, is that it's very difficult to pass that virus to loved ones, especially sexually. So the other thing which is discussed is not the 90, 90, 90, but it's the additional 90, which is the quality of life. And there's very few people globally who are actually looking at that. And so, and so, you know, what is your mental health? What is your, what it, what it, what it, what are your friends and family like? What is your, what, how do you view yourself within society? What other things can we do? And you know, this is a huge thing in in my practice is that. You know, we need to look at that other quality, that other 90%, because, you know, we're not just there to push drugs. We're not there to say, well, Dad, you've taken those pills. Go away. We'll see you in six months' time. There are a multitude of other things to take on board. So just going back to the sexual health centre, you know, we've got, we look after here just in Brisbane uh, of over 800 people living with HIV, of which 10% of those do not have Medicare and they can access their medication from different pathways, and I'll discuss that a little bit later. 8% of the people living with HIV under our care are women, um, and we have a broad spectrum of cultural beliefs and, and religious beliefs. And, you know, within our centre, everyone is diagnosed, but we, well, most of the people are on treatment, and, and, but still there are a few people who, who do not wish to be on treatment and or have very sp specific beliefs. And out of the people who are on treatment, we have close to 100%, 97% of people who are undetectable. We really offer a multi-service and a multi-discipline model, which includes doctors, nurses, psychologists, uh, pharmacists, and uh, and our very sensitive admin staff. So we, we ensure that it, people feel safe culturally as well as confidentiality. And that's one of the things that's uh, uh, why we hope people come back. I, don't, I would say that our care is of high quality, but it's ensuring that we can offer most of the holistic needs of the people who come to us, but we can't offer them all. So I, I think one of the things that uh, Margaret was saying is ensuring that the full medical workup, so sending someone to an infectious disease doctor or a sexual health centre and saying, you know, this is your HIV, but actually someone who's just come over from Africa, she's got six children and a potential seven child, ch child on the way. Um, we don't know what the quality of medical care has been. And actually, it's amazing that there's been a, a availability of antiretrovirals um, since 2008 in, in, a, in a refugee camp. So, so I think really going back to basics, and, and when I say a full medical workup, that also it includes an obstetric, obstetric and gynecological workup, and it also includes a mental health. And doing it in an appropriate, because I'm not sure what language um, is spoken, but you know, we're quite often, uh, as if English isn't your first language, it's appropriate that it's it's done within the right and have the right interpreters there, and that it's taken. And quite often, a full a first meeting might only be a quarter of that, and it would ensure that it's better to have lots of short uh, appointments rather than one long appointment. So TB, of course. Highly, a third of the world's population uh, has got latent TB. There are other opportunistic infections where there's been no mention of where 
uh, the, where an immune system is at this present moment, because even being on antiretrovirals doesn't mean that, uh, that this person is immune, fully immune. Um, and, uh, and again, with sexual partners, you know, it's a big secret. We don't know what's happened to them, whether there's been um, sexual abuse and trauma. We, and culturally, it's, it's a very difficult thing. But it's very important that you do discuss these factors and that uh, the family is really important. And this lady has six dependents, dependent children and she will be having another child in, in uh, four months time. So, so that engagement with care is really got to be patient focused. It's got to be taken at a, at a pace which ensures that you get the right engagement, you get that confidence and if you don't get that confidence and you don't ensure that you know that 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 you've got that person's interests it doesn't matter how how much uh, you try and do you're not going to help that person assimilate to a new country because looking at this lady she has a lot of things on her plate and i think that if i was this person i would be more worried about all these people i've never met before even with their good intentions thrusting their ideas and thoughts and and what they should be doing and i would actually probably like the person who would say well why did we've told you this much today here's here's come back and see us in two weeks time and if you've got any questions we'll ask some questions there um so i think you know there's a lot of 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 things but that's my perspective we do engage with other services, but like I said, there's so many things and, and there's some fantastic non-government or the public health units. And, you know, there's one thing that's, that's uh, in Australia, which I've found, which, it, which, which is working, is, is improving, is developing those cultural links, just because we don't have that, um, the, the, the diversity and, and the networks which have been here for, for as long, but they are getting there. And I think, you know, one of the things that I often say to someone who's living with HIV is that, you know, it, it doesn't matter where you picked up that virus or who gave that virus to you. But look at the responsibilities that, you, you know, you've got, and especially someone like this who's got a, a, a big family, she's got the added um, uh, worries of having her older son who's HIV positive as well. But there's, but one of the things is that, you know, you are, you know, you've just got to pat yourself on the back, look how well you've done, and we will help and build your confidence up from there. No one on the outside knows, so, and you don't need to tell anybody. Um, and then finding a GP, and as, as, you know, and that's a really difficult, because as soon as you mention the word HIV, you've got the most fantastic doctor who's, who's look after every single ailment and illness, but you mentioned G, uh, HIV and someone goes back to medical school mentality and says, well, I can't deal with that. And, but actually, and so it's sitting down with the GPs and finding a GP or GPs already and working out how you can work out a good, you know, joint care, ensuring that they feel comfortable with them. And that actually, um, if there's any questions, just call, call us on the phone. So, you know, it, it, it's, we don't want people coming to, an, uh, to, an, to a building in a, in a, unless they, if they're happy going to their GP, then that will make us happy as well. There's a lot of things which we're looking at, and I won't go over those, but one of the things is pregnancy, of course, and that's really important. And there, and there is a lot of misconceptions about HIV in pregnancy. But not only that, there has been recently some, some, some questions uh, on research about some of the new HIV drugs which aren't safe in pregnancy and might cause problems uh, with neural tube defects. That's starting to go away again now, but, but it's, it's very important that when you are talking about HIV, you talk about the medications, but you also talk about the medications that are appropriate for that person and why you want them to be on those medications. We also, people who are new in the country sometimes end up, end up in correctional services and uh, also there is uh, lots of co-medications the code must say it's it's not a straightforward process it's about ensuring that person in front of you has a question what i haven't mentioned and i'm not going to mention too much about here is stigma stigma and stigma but but one of the things that you can see from everyone who has spoken so far the most important thing is listening and finding out what that person's beliefs are how they want to provide and what their priorities are because this lady actually her priority might be I'm, I'm 20 weeks pregnant. I actually just want to get through this pregnancy and then I want to deal with everything else. I want the kids in the country now. I want to get them into school. 
I don't need to know about my HIV. I've dealt with it for the last uh, 10 years or 12 years, and, I'm, and, and, and I just want to be able to sort out some of those things, and then I can start to relax. It's, 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 it's important to listen, to find out priorities. And this lady sounds like she's done a great job so far. As far as HIV treatment in Australia, it's in the last four or five years, there's been some huge improvements. So we've got 10% of the people we look after uh, from, uh, don't have Medicare. So what does that mean? Well, if you don't have Medicare, it means you can't afford the drugs. There's no, there's, they're, they're not subsidized and you have to pay full rates or you, or you have to um, order very expensive generic drugs from overseas. And, you know, what, that's not going to be any good. But in the last four or five years, two of the big drug pharmaceutical companies have, been, have, have come up with compassionate access programs. And what that means at the end of the day is that if you've got someone new in the country and they've been diagnosed, and the likelihood is that they're going to stay in Australia, then you can apply for them to go on to first-line antiretroviral medication, which, which, which in Australia that really is the best medication becomes first-line medication very, very quickly if it's got through TGA and it's got onto PBS. And so, so out, of the, out of the 80 people we have who don't have medication, 65 of those people are, are, are receiving their medications through compassionate access programs. That, that happens very quickly. So, and especially as someone like this who's probably on a, on a, on a, on a combination which isn't particularly up to date and has got side effects, we could have this person uh, on, on what we'll class that, which is what, usually one pill a day. And where the HIV drugs are is in the last three, three years, they can't make a better HIV drug. So what the companies have been doing in the last three years is actually tweaking to make it more user friendly, less drug drug interactions, and, uh, and actually um, makes it easier for someone to take them without restrictions to food, doesn't affect your cholesterol, doesn't kill your kidneys. Um, so all those things are, are, are fantastic. So that's one of the things, sitting down with someone and saying, look, you know, yes, you have been on this medication, but actually you can be on this medication. It's not going to cost you anything. Um, but again, if someone's been taking medication for 12 years, even if it's been giving them lots of side effects, that can be quite a difficult challenge. Um, the generic, uh, there are genetics and some people opt to still import drugs from their own country, but nobody who passes through uh, one of the public funded clinics can, will walk away without giving the option, they will be, have the opportunities to be put on to uh, antiretroviral. And it's, and it's usually the best that we've got just because we take that person. And when I'm prescribing, I like to prescribe not for next week, not for two weeks away, but at least for the next five years. And that's taken on board with, you know, other medications at the GP or other comorbidities, especially hepatitis B. As I said, for the ongoing care with us, having a nurse manager for the first year to 12 months is really important. Linking people in with QPP, and I think Tico is going to give us a, an update in a while, and making sure that um, people feel comfortable and make sure that they're either, uh, and it's an NGO which fits the needs of, of, of the people who are in front of you. There are other community services, and I said, you know, so that for all of you are here tonight, and you can see what the wonderful job uh, that there are and who's around. Having the right interpreter, ensuring that people are comfortable. We bring people back a lot in the first 12 months, and I think that doesn't hurt anybody, but we, but we do take it at that person's pace. And, what I, and my usual words to someone is, I'm here to offer you advice and not tell you what to do. Um, and as we mentioned, we do have people who um, have been in Australia for a few years and maybe go back to visit family and friends, um, and all common sense goes out the window. So the availability of PrEP really ensures that um, people don't come back with a surprise. And it is complex management, management when you look at this, because this is someone who's new to the system. I think that, you know, with, with children uh, involved, uh, the, children, the family definitely takes a huge priority and working very closely with um, the children's units. And one of the things that we've developed in the last couple of years is ensuring that children who are HIV positive have the opportunity to trans when they transition to adult uh, medicine, that they get the opportunity to do that in a very seamless way. And quite often we inv inv invite the, their guardians or their family to be part of that process.
Um, there are acute services if something else happens, because it's not just about HIV, it can be about people's hearts, kidneys, liver, mental health. There is QPP who offer a very um, encompassing peer navigation, which gives people the opportunity to, 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 to discuss their concerns uh, and living with HIV with people with the same experience. We ensure that there's always an interpreter present. There's compassionate access to ensure that people get good, clean antiretrovirals. We have psychology who run clinics every day. Um, we have pharmacists on site who can sit down and really explain why we're taking those pills, why it's better to take it now, and why it's better to, um, to not uh, take it with uh, a glass of milk or why you shouldn't be taking it in the morning. We do ensure that, uh, that, as, as, that no, none of the patients belong to any of the doctors or nurses and ensure that we, with anyone that's new to the service, we, we, we have a, a discussion about, and we have a weekly case conference and that's a multidisciplinary and we discuss about many factors and, the, and with this new person and, what, and how we are providing that service and what needs they might be. And actually it's a, it's a, it's a very rewarding meeting and I think we, um, from this meeting, uh, it, it allows a, a tailored care plan for that person who's new to the service. There are S100 prescribers in the community, and um, and in Brisbane, there's uh, at least uh, 12 people who are S100 prescribers, um, and it's up to the choice of the patient. And we and and we make people aware that there are they, that there are GPs and there are that they can get their care, and they don't have to come to a big, um, ugly building to get their care. It's up to them. And, uh, and, you know, with, uh, and it's important that we are linked in. So we do, there are immigration, we do linking with immigration lawyers and experts, and we work very closely with uh, an organization in Sydney called HALP, which is a HIV and AIDS legal um, council councils. And uh, it's really important that when people are having problems with immigration, that they're linked in with the right people. So it's all about collaborative care. It's all about the person in front of you. It's making that adjustment. It's not just about the diagnosis of HIV. It's not about throwing pills at anybody. It's ensuring that you know you are meeting the needs of that person. Because once you've got the trust of that person, once they feel that you have their interests at heart with which we do, then you can actually start to improve. And you know, HIV is not a death sentence although there is a lot of mental health and a lot of other community support, children and family, ensuring in terms of good communication, building that relationship. And, and it, within Queensland, we're, we're actually got a fledgling um, sexual health network, which is being developed between acute and community service. And, and hopefully that will be able to offer a much better comprehensive care and a standard of care across the whole state. Uh, and the most important is listen. Thank you.